Right now on Top of the Pops, it's time to bring you Uriah Heep. Was John Lawton a good replacement for David Byron? The guy had a, a monumental task on his hand with big shoes to fill. I said before the wise man in the order of my youth. As a replacement, no, I don't think so. As a, as a singer for Uriah Heep, yes, I think he was at the time. Certainly the best option the band had. If you need to find the truth. What John did have was a great singing voice. I mean, he was a good singer, didn't he? <laughs> Of course, John would never be able to match David Byron for flamboyance or showmanship, but then again, nobody could really. He was unique. Now, there are two ways bands can go when they're looking to replace a great frontman. They can look for a counterfeit, if you want, a facsimile, someone who's similar in style and presentation, or they can go a completely different route. He quite sensibly decided to go for someone very different. He was so different from David Byron. David Byron was a traditional kind of frontman as Rod Stewart and Mick Jagger, the way he moved on stage and played with the crowd. And there was a man with uh, feathers in his ear and uh, eyeshadow and a complete different voice. And he had a leather suit on. So that was, well, at first it was uh, difficult to see, to see him as uh, the brilliant new singer of Uriah Heep, really. John Lawton gradually endeared himself to the fans and he could handle all the old stuff easily. He significantly, Heap were becoming less heavy musically as well. So maybe this contributed to some of the, the discontent of, of, of some of the fans. But I thought he was a great front man. I thought he was an excellent replacement. But I'm looking for an easy way. I'd only been in the band a week, so I really didn't have much of a say who was going to be in the band, and I didn't really think I should say anything anyway. You know, I mean, it, Ainsley was ruling the roost at the time, so or trying to at the time, you know, so it was more down to him and the other. Whereas David was a pop rock singer, as I've said before, uh, which suited the band's reputed style and certainly suited the songs I wrote. John was more of a blues rock singer. I grew up in, uh, in the Northeast, and the, and the music that I was listening to at that time, there was a lot of very much blues based. John Lee Hooker, uh, Muddy Waters, you name it, I listened to it. And I grew up with that, and I think that was a music, and I, I still feel these days that that's where my roots are. In a live situation, it was, it was great, because John was a good performer, and his voice was very powerful. Um, but again, you're talking about somebody who's essentially irreplaceable. So I would prefer to look at John not as David's replacement, but just as another singer for Uriah Heep. And I think that he did a very, very good job. John Lawton was, was another mistake. He had a great voice, but he put on that voice. It wasn't a natural voice. He, he looked bad. I mean, he, had a, he was bald or balding and uh, he was a bad replacement. Uh, he was a nice guy and uh, he wasn't a showman, so he failed on almost every count. He was a great screamer, as he, he showed on tracks like uh, Free and Easy and Sympathy. Absolutely an unbelievable singer. Realistically, so many songs belong to David Byron, from the likes of Easy Living, to July Morning, to Gypsy. There was no way that John Lawton, even though he was a better singer, could really do justice in the way that Byron did. They were David Byron's songs. I had the pleasure of seeing Heap at Reading in 1977 when they topped the bill, and Lawton was fantastic. His enthusiasm for singing the old uh, Byron songs was 
absolutely uh, spot on. He, he, he was keen to give the fans exactly what they wanted. Uh, there were some fans who were ungracious and refused to accept him under any circumstances. When you asked me in 2004 if um, John did justice to Uri Heap classic songs, I would say yes, because he, 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 is, he sing them, he's still singing, but he was then singing them in his own way. When you have asked me that in 1977, I would have said no, because I would like to hear David Byron singing the classic songs. I think Lawton brought a vibrance to the Vi Byron era songs. I mean, no one was ever going to replace David Byron, that was very, very clear. But he had his own look, he had his own setup, um, and, and visually, some would argue he wasn't as good as David Byron. Some obviously would argue that he was, he was better in, in whatever vein. We went to a huge amount of trouble to get him in the band, but looking back on it, I'm amazed that we bothered, really. He was good, he, he could, he, especially in Germany, he could talk to him in German. Uh, <laughs> but he, he was great, you know, he, he, he was a good singer. Uh, the only thing that was a bit weird was on that Blue Island makeup he used to put on. You can remember that. <laughs> Apart from losing David Byron, he also had to find a replacement for John Wetton, who quit pretty much at the same time. And they decided to go for Trevor Boulder. The reason why I joined it, is, I suppose, is because of Woody Woodman, see, actually. He was at Bronze Records one day and somebody happened to say, oh, Heap were looking for a bass player. And he said, oh, I know somebody who might be interested. And so he rang me up and said, Heap were looking for a bass player. I ring this guy up and he gave me this number and it was Ken Ensley, so I rang Ken at home. And he said, oh yeah, we're auditioning on, it was a Sunday. Uh, Len, July morning, Easy Living and someone else would be there by four, I think it was. So I went down and uh, we played July morning and we played Easy Living and we messed about for a little bit. And uh, me and Mick had the same birthday and were the same height, so I got the job. <laughs> I got nothing to do with the plane. <laughs> Trevor Bowler is really a very talented bass player and when he uh, joined Jurai Heap uh, we were very proud because he played with Dave Bowie on Aladdin Insane and uh, Hunky Dory and The Spiders from Mars. So yeah, we were very proud that he was joining Jurai Heap. He was a completely different bass player from John Wetton or Gary Tain. What Trevor Boulder brought to Urahi was something very safe and sturdy. The thing with Boulder is you can lean back against his bass lines and know you're not going to fall over. He's not the spectacular player that John Wetton is, and he certainly wasn't the supple master that Gary Thane was, but he was much steadier and he gave the band a great grounding. He is the closest thing for me to, to the style of Gary Thane, the melodic, the long melodic lines, the steady plodding bass lines, absolutely fantastic. Trevor has his own style, I think he's a really good player, very smooth and fluid player. Uh, his playing moves a lot, and I think he's also very much more versatile perhaps than uh, John Wetton was. Uh, Trevor can play in many different styles and be comfortable in all of them. Firefly put your eye heat very much back on track after a couple of hit and misses and misfiles as well. They needed to come back strongly with an album that showcased what John Lawton was about and took your eye heap forward. And Firefly was definitely that album. It had a good rock element. The um, harmonic vocals were in there in all the right places. And you had the consistency of playing added, I think, very much by Trevor Boulder's playing. I mean, the songs were really, really good. Yeah, it was a good album. It's still 
There's still some really classic songs on there, heap songs on there, I think, you know. And Ken Hensley brought some great compositions uh, to that album, and the performances were universally very, of a very high standard. It was, a, it was an excellent record. Don't take me for granted, cause you know I'm a just like you. And I'm too hand of death, you want me to? Who needs to be who needs me now? It was a complete different album. Jerry Brown was back in as a producer. Mr. Non-producer. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe on the producing side, it could have done a better job. He just sat there and read air aircraft magazines and go, yes, that, that's a good take. <laughs> now do it again. <laughs> Did he know? Yeah. So Jerry was a, I don't know, he wasn't a musician. There's not a memorable song on it. Um, a sign of great failure, produced by me, I'm afraid, but you know, it just wasn't good enough. I mean, at that point, we're losing everything. You know, we've got John Lawton as the lead singer, not as good as David Byron by any means at all. Um, I don't know, it just didn't work. And songs like The Hanging Tree, Firefly itself, are very melodic and very simple. As Hensley always said, that Uriah right, Heep should play simple, melodic songs and they were back in again. Firefly, I, it was an okay album. I missed, I definitely missed David by that time. I think some of the songs I wrote for Firefly would have been much better had David sung them. Nevertheless, I think we did with the best we could with what we had, and to be honest, I was beginning to really seriously lose interest in the whole project at that time. The sound is generally lighter than previous Heap albums, but Heap were to naturally evolve. Uh, some lovely songs on there. The title track, Firefly, is beautiful with some sensitive sections and some heavy sections and great harmonies. It had The Hanging Tree, it had Wise Man, two very strong songs, and above all, it had a great anthem in sympathy. So, at last, Heap were g making good records again. Sympathy was one of the highlights of Firefly for me, but then I love the guitar playing in that song. One of the things that really stands out with it is almost the Wishbone Ash-esque guitar trade-off between Ken Hensley, who picked up the guitar rather than the keyboard on this one, and Mick Box. And it's, it's acid, it's, it's rock, it's not sweet like Brian May's sound. Um, some great vocals, proving once again that um, John Lawton could scream with the best of them. It's a fantastic song that really rolls along and you expect it at any point to take off and it never does. And that's the beauty, it is slightly understated and that really accentuates how good the song is. It's a shuffle in D minor uh, and I have to make mention of the wonderful drumming on this. There are very few drummers that can play that 12-8 shuffle as can Lee with, with the uh, intricate bass drum work. Um, and it's, it, it's a noteworthy performance from Lee. All in all, a great track.
Sympathy was more of a throwback to the earlier days of Uriah Heep. Sympathy had a lot of the powerful ingredients that songs like Stealing and so on had. So I think, I don't know if it's the highlight for me, I tend to go for more for pure musical highlights, but I think as a song it was a bit more like Uriah Heep. The highlight of, the, of Firefly, in my view, was the Firefly, the song itself. Some say it is Sympathy, but I don't think so. Sympathy was a hit song in a few uh, European countries. It was in Holland, for instance. It's a very catchy song, but Firefly is uh, back to uh, the mystical side of Uriah Heep with all the hallmarks in there. I said before the wise man in the order of my youth And I told him all the things I had to know A wise man has always been one of my favorites. Ken wrote, Ken Hensley wrote this song and it just has a real nice feel to it. And it was one of the first songs I ever sang with Heep anyway. So that it was so Is Wise Man a great song compared to Every Breath I Take or You Take or House of the Rising Sun? I don't know, it's not really for me to say. A lot of Heap fans like Wise Man. It's not a, not a personal favourite of mine. I think it's a good song, but there were better songs on the album. Yeah, I liked it. It was all right, you know. It's, it's poppy. Poppy Heap song, really wise man. But I mean, a lot of people like it, a lot of Heap fans like it. Keep on living, loving, waiting your time. Is the only way to ease your concern. After years of trying, in many respects, with stronger material like Easy Living and Stealing, Uriah Heap finally had a chart hit in the UK and it was really bizarre to see my band, if you like, on top of the pops. I don't know how we got on. I don't know who grabbed who to get us on. <laughs> when we came to do it on top of the pops, it was actually, the singing was live, but we were using the original backing track. I hope the BBC is not going to see this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To be honest, I think we were apparent before we did the show, because we'd been there from 11 o'clock in the morning. You'd take a band and stick it in the, in a place from 11 in the morning and you're not really shooting it till late at night and there's a bar. <laughs> yeah. That chance of us being sober when they shoot it properly. I had been using the uh, the image of the, the earrings and, and, the, and the makeup around the eyes looking like something out of, it, out of Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure whether we could go on top of the pops with me looking like that and singing a song like Wise Man or not. But in the end, we decided that uh, I should carry on that image onto Top of the Pops, and we did it with Dave Lee Travis, and uh, I sang it live, and uh, it turned out really well. I have never seen it since. I would really like to see the original of that. That would be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> The song works very, very well indeed. It's not exactly a classic heavy rock tune by any stretch, but it's a great, great song with great dynamics. It allowed Lawton to be what he is, a great singer. Lawton brought a certain soulful aspect, a certain gospel aspect to the vocals in Uriah Heep and also to the music. And this really came out with Wise Man because it's that sort of song. You can't imagine David Byron singing something like that. Innocent Victim was the band's second album of 1977 and it was their 11th album for Christ's sake which is some would say overkill and it, certainly you can't criticise them for uh, laziness. Innocent Victim is actually a rather good album. In many respects it's better than what had gone before because it does have the likes of the title track Free and Easy and of course Free Me which is an all-time Uriah Heap classic. 
Overall though, somehow it didn't hang together as well as Firefly. To some fans, the album was a disappointment because it had got a little bit softer in some areas. But if you listen to the album today, and, and I've remastered this very recently, even mixing extra tracks which were recorded at the same time but not included on the album, it has a vibrance that I think has stood the test of time. And I know you say I'm drifting, drifting on a dream. You better watch your step, boy. You know it may not be what it seems. It's, it's got a country feel about it, hasn't it? You know, a country, it, it veers off the rock and has this Kenny Ensley's gone eagerly sort of feel about it, doesn't it? You know, I think that maybe a lot of people like to that, you know, especially with uh, Free Me, the single, and, and when they bought the album. Every, I mean, it, it just, that album just took off. In sales terms, it became one of the, the best selling albums ever behind me here. Uh, you've got one of the gold discs that the band were awarded in Australia for sales of that album and the, the same pattern was being repeated all over the world so commercially it worked very well even as musically it wasn't their strongest work. The album featured songs by Jack Williams who was a, a colleague of Ken Hensley's signed to his Humble Tunes company. Songs like Keep On Riding, the open, opening track, The Dance and Choices um, which were a little unheap like but fair songs on their own. Uh, it was generally untypical heap with the exception of Free and Easy which by any standards is, is one of the better heap songs. This is absolutely great. Free and Easy does definitely have the stamp of Demons and Wizards Magician's Birthday era Uriah Heap in the way it's presented, in the way it's performed, and also in the way Don Lawton sings it. And he does a very good job. It's got that acoustic heavy interrelationship, it's got the melody, and it's very much built in the same way that Heap had done so often in the earlier part of their career with David Byron. Free and Easy was definitely back to the old Heap sound. Lawton and Box obviously willing to inject some a bit of fire back into the band. It's another shuffle in D, um, and it was tailor-made for John Lawton's vocal. Obviously, he co-wrote the song. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Some fine drumming, and the high spot for me is that wonderful guitar duel between Ken Hensley's slide and Mick Box, which we witnessed again at the first Magician's Birthday Party gig. Absolutely magic, and, and this to me is what they should have been doing around about that time. Free and Easy was fantastic. That was Mick Box doing what he does best. He went wild on his guitar and, and it's a classic, you know, two and a half minute frenzy of a number. Brilliant stuff. That's good, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I enjoy that. Anything that rocks that's got some real good feel about it, yeah. I, I enjoy it. I don't think it's it really stands to the standards of Uriah Heap because there is not much focal harmony, there is no really mystic um, you know, fairy tale kind of lyrics there. It's, it's just a uh, guitar fight really, but uh, we liked it. Yeah, it's got those elements. Free and Easy is a, a, a song which has got things which people consider to be familiar parts of the Uriah Heap formula, as it were. Mm, so not my favourite song, but good energy. As far as I can tell, you knew so well, I was always at the end of the line. I, I 
think the high of innocent victim was was Freeman, without a question. Uh, interesting story, really, because we had practically finished the album. Nobody felt terribly strongly about it, but it was a decent album. And then I wrote Free Me at home, recorded it in my studio, and on virtually the last day of recording Innocent Victim, I brought it into the studio, Jerry played it, everybody fell in love with it. The track, before we put the voices on, sounded so terrific that I went upstairs, because we had the studio downstairs and the offices upstairs, to look up the contract to see what the unrecouped advance was, because I was so convinced it was going to be an enormous success and I was going to have to find the money to pay the band. It was never that big a hit, but it sounded fantastic in the studio. So in a way, we'd almost got back to something that we had lost. So it was a very, very good track. And it became the the focal track, uh, the focus track of the album eventually, and a, and a very huge success, successful single in many countries. It fitted John Lawton perfectly, allowed him to really open up that tremendous range. And of course it became a surprising hit for them, especially in countries such as South Africa, because of the sentiments of the song, and also the fact that the title stood out, and it really became almost an anti-apartheid anthem, which must have surprised Urahi greatly. Free Me was very much uh, an unexpected hit. Uh, obviously there was an attempt there to capture the same atmosphere as Lady in Black, and it certainly treads a very similar vein. I think Jerry Brown had been saying to Kenny, you know, you've got to come up with another Lady of But we just had Lady in Black as a massive hit single in Germany. So you've got to have another hit after it. So Free Me was geared towards filling that gap and the next hit single. I mean, Lady in Black, when he took off for the second time in Germany, was one of the biggest singles ever in Germany. So, I mean, you've got to come up with something else. So I think Ken thought Lady in Black and and he came up with Freeman. Why won't you free me? Come on and free me. Free me from your spell. Free me had the ingredients of a hit single and it, and it ultimately went on to become a, a hit single. So I don't know whether it was unexpected or not, but it, it worked. It worked very, very well. It's a very commercial song and it's a very happy song and it's a song that's easy for people to sing the hook and most hits are about hooks anyway so Free Me was huge here in Spain, it was huge here in Spain so um, it, a surprise yes but looking back not totally unexpected. It was great, I mean it, it was a good pop tune, I think the band were, were quite proud of it. Uh, the 12-string guitar is a nice touch in there, uh, but certainly John Lawton voiced his dissatisfaction with it. He said it, it just wasn't what Heap were about. But the one good thing of course is that it, it broadened the audiences. What was perhaps not such a good thing was that it brought in a new audience that weren't aware of Heap's heavy rock background and I think some of them were a little bit shocked when they uh, maybe bought Free Me as a single and then went to see the band live and were surprised at how much heavier it, heavier it was on stage. Uriah Heap certainly went in a, another direction from where they came from. And uh, I don't think they lost direction, they just choose to do another way of making music. Ken was trying to write poppy hit singles. Okay, we might have had one massive big album, but in some respects you tend to lose your, your, your hardcore fans, that are the rock fans, that buy all your albums. And I think it's, uh, it wasn't good to, to go completely in that direction that Ken wanted it to go. I think Heap had lost uh, direction at this time. It was really the first time we see an outside songwriter being used uh, to augment Ken Hensley's writing. Ken was clearly feeling at, at the limits of his ability to continue to deliver albums on this treadmill and, and bringing in a, a co-writer 
was an attempt to try and keep things fresh. I failed to see the necessity of bringing in outside writers, talented as Jack Williams was. I, th I think there may have been resentment that outside writers were being brought in. John Lawton has since voiced his dissatisfaction with doing popular stuff like Free Me, which, um, although it was a huge hit, he certainly didn't feel comfortable with. I hate to criticise him, I think a lot of this is down to the production. Jerry Brown was locked into a cycle. He was very much part of Uriah Heep's, Uriah Heep's entourage. He needed someone from the outside to come in and really dust down the band and say, listen, this guy has got a tremendous range. He can give you something extra. Let him do it. Let's write to his strengths rather than writing to the strengths of the band as of yore and trying to fit him in. I think we lost direction, you know, I lost direction a long time before songs like Free and Easy. I, I think that uh, we started to lose direction after Gary died and I think we continued to go progressively downhill from there. I had numerous conversations with Jerry about my desire to leave the band and do something new. I was always convinced to stay, let's do another record, let's do one more tour and so on and I did that. But honestly I felt the band was more like a tribute band by that time. I think it's hugely sad, the lack of input songwriting-wise from, from Mick Box in these last couple of albums. I think he, his fire and the essence of his songs was, was vital to counterbalance what Ken was doing. Um, and I think the, the, the direction was a little bit haywire at this time. I don't think they had lost direction with Innocent Victim. I think they were trying to focus their direction even more so, and they were certainly trying to garner more sales. Now whether that was through record company pressure or the fact that Ken and, and the other members of the band were writing songs that were actually going to do very, very well is, is another matter. No, I think they were trying to find or focus a direction even further on than Firefly. Fallen Angel took Uriah Heep even further down the, the pop track. It was a very poppy album from the opener onwards. Fallen Angel followed very much in the pattern of what had gone before with Firefly and Innocent Victim. It wasn't a great album. It had its great moments. Come Back to Me and Fallen Angel itself were two very, very good tracks. But in reality, at this point, the band really were treading water. Fallen Angel surprised me because by then Bronze was with Chrysalis and I remember vividly taking it to Chrysalis and they had one of these big meetings where 20 people turn up and you play the record to them and they actually clapped after some track so they must have liked something there but I didn't think it was that good. I, I put Fallen Angel and Firefly into the same general category of albums that weren't really approached with real solid conviction at least on my part. Yes I produced the songs and yes I thought Fallen Angel was a decent song but speaking for myself, no, I didn't approach that album with any real conviction in terms of saying this is going to be a great record. I just, it's going to be a record and that's it. If it's great, that would be like pure luck. the 12th studio album and it was the last one to feature John Lawton and incidentally Lee Kerslake for a while who had also had enough uh, and departed. It had its moments, I think mixed guitar work on What Do You Say was quite interesting uh, and they'd begun to delve into the production techniques that were becoming increasingly available to them. At the time I remember being hugely disappointed but in retrospect, it's one of these albums that I enjoy enormously today. I don't think Fallen Asian was an improvement on Innocent Victim. 
but I also don't think it was a big disappointment either. It was in a similar vein, albeit they had cut the song lengths down in some, in some cases. There are some great numbers on Fallen Angel. Fallen Angel did have, of course, Come Back To Me, which is again one of the career highlights of uh, Uriah Heep and was a, a well-deserved hit single on the continent. Alone again, I feel so alone again With this emptiness, I just can't hide Lee Kerr's Lake's Come Back To Me, I think, is a heat classic. Come Back To Me was the third of the great classics that John Lawton recorded. We had Sympathy, we had Free Me, this was the third one. Many, many heaps just like this song very much. I've loved it, of course I loved it. It means it's very important to me. It's a loss of my family, my little boy and my wife in the past. Come Back To Me is a real underrated classic. It's an excellent composition, brilliantly sung, brilliantly arranged. It's a wonderful song. It's a fantastic ballad, and it really should have been acclaimed and hailed as a classic long since, but never really did. Maybe because it was following in the footsteps of Freeman, which had been such a big hit, it would seem almost as a rewrite. It isn't a rewrite. And if you listen to the, the differences in structure between the two songs, it becomes very obvious that Uriah Heep didn't follow the template of Free Me for Come Back To Me. It stands out in its own right. It's in E flat, which is an unusual key for Uriah Heep. Um, they'd always tended to stick with the, the strident, open, suitable for guitar keys, but E flat was just right for John Lawton's vocal. And I think he delivered one of the best vocals that he could possibly have done. It's a nice song. I don't think it's underrated. I, I think, again, it's a bit of a pastiche of other songs of a similar kind. It's not a great song. It's a nice song. I wouldn't put it any higher than that. It's got uh, great emotional values in there. And, uh, but it's a ballad. And I'm not sure if many hip fans like ballads that much. But for that era, for the Lawton era, it was, yeah, it was a classic. Come Back To Me is a good song. Personally, I wouldn't call it a classic. I think some of the songs on Fallen Angel, like the title track itself, Fallen Angel, were far better than Come Back To Me. But I can see why the fans liked it. I think Come Back To Me is a very good song. Um, I think there are many good pop elements about it. I think it's a very, very good song. Whether it's underrated or not, I don't know. It's not a song I get asked to play very often. Uh, in fan situations or concerts or wherever, uh, I don't see that it gets much radio play, so I, maybe it, it was a good song in the right place on the right album, but I don't think it was powerful enough overall to become a classic or anything like that. It's a good song, there's no doubt about it, it's a really good song, but it, it's not a July morning, is it? You know, and it, it, it's not an easy living and it's, it's not a look at yourself or a bed of prey or a yeah. you know, sunrise. Those sort of songs, it's, it's, it's not got that element in it. I mean, we still play those songs today. Why do we play those songs today? Because everybody likes them. Love or Nothing from the Fallen Angel album is a very decent, very healthy ballad. Again, it showcased what John Norton was so good at, which is opening up a song and really enriching it with that wonderful tone that he had. Love or Nothing in C minor with a strong acoustic feel. I actually like the sort of Crosby, Stills and Nash vibe to the song, uh, although it's definitely somewhat on the poppy side for some of the fans. Not for me. Not for me, I liked it. I thought it was, a, it was a good song and it was a pop song. There's no question it was a pop song. But does that, does that invalidate the song? No, I don't think so, not in my opinion. If you want to look at every song that Uriah Heep did from a purely 
formulaic uh, standpoint, if you want to compare every song with Easy Living or Stealing, then yeah, you could say it's too much of a pop song, but too much of a pop song compared to what? And for some reason, I love that song myself because it's uh, catchy and uh, it always uh, stayed in my, in my head, really. Although there is a lot of la 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 on that song, I have to admit. <laughs> For Love or Nothing was a pop song. I don't think it was too much of a pop song. I just think there were too many pop songs on Fallen Angel. I think that if the rest of the album had have featured a lot more rock stuff, the fans would have been probably more liable to have accepted this song um, as an excursion into a lighter moment. But I, I actually really like this, although it certainly is poppy. It stood the test of time rather well over the years. A, a lot of what Heap has done, especially at that point, now stands as nostalgia, antiquated and slightly dated. Love or Nothing could actually be re-recorded today and it would stand up rather well. For me, I thought it worked as a song, but evidently other people didn't think that because they never threw very much energy behind it. I, one song that I would pick as a natural single. I thought it was a very radio-friendly song, but purely my opinion. Without a doubt, on Fallen Angel, the band had strayed too far away from its identity as a hard rock, heavy band. It had become too much immersed in the acoustic pop side of the band, which was always there, this lighter, melodic uh, frame of mind, but it took over too much on Fallen Angel. I think it, it progressed in a way that was fairly natural. There was never an attempt to steer it in any direction, so that was fine. Um, I think they, they fell to pieces and as things disintegrate it goes in a direction but I, I don't think they ever lost their their original drive, it just the drive wasn't as strong as it had been at the beginning. Uriah Heap was struggling to find a way forward that allowed them to hold on to their roots but also to bring something new onto the horizon and it was a great struggle for them and part of the reason was there was so much entrenchment within the band. They needed to open up, needed to be far greater and wider in their vision and they were locking themselves down. I just think the band had completely lost interest in the band. I think we gathered a lot of interest in the money and all the things around uh, the band. And I'm just as guilty of that as anybody else. The problem for me, with me, was that my losing interest was a little bit more radical than like Lee losing interest because I wrote all the songs for the band. And so, you know, songs were our strength and we lost that strength. And I take some responsibility for that. I think Ken had got fed up with the fact that he was being attacked for writing all the songs. The band were on his back, they wanted to write songs, they wanted to make money out of writing songs, they didn't deserve to. Ken really sort of tried to rule the roost in every area and he was in league with Jerry. Um, John Lawton was writing some songs, I mean I got a couple of bits in there on songs. So John was writing with, and Mick was writing with John and Lee was it. But the majority of the stuff was coming out of Ken. Really, it should have been more rock. It should have been more experimental. And all Ken was trying to do in some respects was write another Lady in Black, Free Me, or whatever. And if he wrote enough songs like that, maybe one of them would be a massive hit and he'd earn more money out of it, I suppose. You know You've got to understand that definitely after Free Me they were under great pressure to produce ever more commercial singles and they were seduced by the possibility that America may open up big for them once again. And it wasn't so much that they weren't doing the hard rock, what they weren't doing were the epic numbers and I think it was the epic numbers in many ways that made Uriah Heep. You have a look at any big selling album, there are one or two tracks that had some some extended pieces and certainly pieces that when they played them live they took this five or six seven minute piece and stretched it out sometimes to double that length and, and it worked extremely well in a live environment. I don't really think Fallen Angel had anything they could do that with.
John Lawton as a singer had one great quality above everything else, sincerity. When he sang a song, he really believed that what he was singing were lyrics he meant, meant he felt passionate about and came direct from his soul. And soul is the key and operative word here because John Lawton wasn't just a great rock singer, he had a soulful element to it and a gospel element to it. He was an inspired singer as well. John is a superb singer, technically, um, and has a one of those rare voices which alongside David Coverdale and Paul Rogers is one of the great British rock voices. Can't fault him. He can do it all, you know. He's, he's, uh, he can do anything you want. If you want, if you want him to sing in a certain way, I'm sure he can just do it. You know, he's got the ability, he's got the knowledge, he's practiced his craft all these years, and, and, he, and he can just go in there and do it. Well, he's just one of the best rock vocalists ever. Still is today. And I think it's a real shame that he's not playing in a band like Uriah Heep. I mean, here is a guy who, who can hit any note at any time of the day, and you will never hear the guy sing a bum note. Sympathy just doesn't mean that much to me. Compassion is not the fashion. And if you're looking for a shoulder to cry on, but turn your head my way, cause I'd rather have my music than the day. Oh, yeah. I think that his, his stage singing was maybe better than David's was, because he always had a little bit trouble by singing on stage, and John was, well, a very good singer. He had an incredibly powerful and fat voice. Uh, he was a great ad-libber. If you listen to the stuff that he did on Sympathy and Free and Easy, he had the ability to do very soulful ad-libs. When we went down to South Africa, um, and he sang with us down in South Africa when Benny lost his voice, and we got out there and we did the first key, it was like, and he started doing his soul stuff, you know, at the end of songs, like, it was like, Jesus Christ, what voice, you know? A really, really great voice he's got, uh, and powerful. God, you, you, know, you have to turn him down in the monitors, you know, because he's louder than we're louder than you. I don't know how he does it, to be honest. I mean, because lately when we've, he's sung with us, and he still don't think, like, well, he's in his 50s now, so someone's got to start giving a bit. He's got to start dropping keys or something, you know, the voices. Not with John. He's still up there. <laughs> I'm still doing it. I'd have to say there were many good things about our, our time together with John. I think John brought some different things to the band. Uh, his studio work was phenomenal. I mean, his studio work was amazing. The notes that he could reach, the ideas he brought to the melodies, his improvisational skills were fantastic. Not something that we were in any way used to. On stage live, he never came to the stage weak. His voice was always strong, his presence was powerful. For some reason, Ken took offense to something and uh, they finished up arguing, the pair of them, and the next thing, Ken wanted him off. Unfortunately for me, I always compared him to David, and that's a fatal thing to do. I should never have done that. You make those wrong comparisons or you put people into the wrong category as a replacement. Uh, does Phil Lanzan replace me? No. Is Phil Lanzan a good keyboard player? Yes. But you ask any fan, and, and any real fan, and you write a heap for them, was David Byron, Mick Box, Lee Coast, like Gary Thane and me. But I did hear rumours later on, Ken did want rid of everybody, so I mean, he, he would have replaced the whole band so he could take control of it, you know. Um, but he failed in that one. I mean, there has to be a reason why Led Zeppelin chose not to replace John Bonham. And look at, look at the failed attempts that The Who made to replace Keith Moon. I mean, you establish a uh, combined identity, and one element is broken away from that permanently. And that's going to be an awful tough decision to make. So don't
there was a fourth album recorded which has been um, infamously titled Five Miles. It's not, you know, a from the vault selection. This was the fourth album that John Lawton recorded with Uriah Heep. Ken Hensley was in there, of course, and so was Lee Kerslake. You know, that is a complete album produced by Jimmy Miller. Brilliant singing on it, and it's absolutely stunning. We've done an album that we scrapped. We've never got released. Um, John had written some songs on it, and Ken had written some songs, and it was, it had even gone even further into the poppy country. And it wasn't heap at all. You know, I mean, even Jerry Brown noticed it, and oh, that was amazing. That, that it, and we were, we were all, I remember me and Mick and Lee, I think we were, we were worried about it, because we weren't getting any control over it, and it just sounded really, not good, you know. It wasn't the songwriting wasn't good. Ken had lost it in that area, I think, and nobody was coming up with the goods. Let's put it that way on this album. In terms of what Uriah Heep produced and recorded, the John Lawton era can only be really credited as a partial success. They never made the great album they were capable of. If you took tracks from each of the three records that John Lawton recorded with them, Firefly, Innocent Victim and Fallen Angel, you could make a great record. But each one of them has its downsides. It never really gelled and took off. And it's not John Lawton's fault. He offered Heap a way forward that they didn't quite grasp. And the reason I'm convinced is because there were one or two members of the band so locked into the past they couldn't see into the future and the changes need to be made. I think the problems they had was there were personality clashes between um, various members of the band and I think John Lawton, fairly or unfairly, copped a lot of that. For, for the die-hard Uriah Heep fan who was brought up with uh, Salisbury, with Demons and Wizards, with Look at Yourself, I think the Lawton era was kind of a disappointment because they didn't bring the music the real Uriah Heep fan loved. I don't think he should be given any blame whatsoever for the lightning of the Heap sound. I think he was more than willing to keep it up there and heavy. Um, but I think there was some rewarding stuff there. And also a couple of the things that he had written and co-written um, contributed very much to the to the band's success. I, I think he was a great front man. I think the Lawton area was a success. I mean, it obviously proved it with sales. It kept the band going in a very, very difficult time for hard rock. You know, you had the advent of punk. You had a band that was working and living primarily in the UK where punk had hit hardest. So I think they were very, very lucky and also very clever and hard working to pull it off. When John Lawton left the band, they brought in John Sloman, who was a good singer in his own right, not as good as John Lawton, and certainly didn't have the personality of David Byron. And as a result, they ended up with an album that's possibly one of the worst of their career. Conquest is a hugely uh, controversial album in terms of Uriah Heap history, and it's very much debated even to this day. For me personally, it's one of my all-time favourite albums, and it's one of the few albums I think consistently works on every single track. But I understand why there are a large number of Uriah Heap fans who really detest that record. At the time, I didn't think that uh, Conquest was a good album, because you didn't hear Uriah Heap that much. You didn't hear the hallmarks of Uriah Heap in the songs. Um, many years later I learned to appreciate this album as quite a good album. There are very strong songs on there and I think it's uh, the highlight album for Trevor Bowler. Very good bass playing there. 
Trevor was actually really coming into his own by now. His songs were starting to become more important. Um, but Sloman was not greeted warmly by the fans. Was Conquest a good album? Deathly silence there, isn't there? Not really, no. When you look at Conquest, you, you, you look at the personnel, you look at the songs, and you realise that none of this is, is as good as it used to be. John Sloman is doing all the vocals, backing vocals, piano, you see, you know, he, he was a very good all-round musician. But he's not a David Byron, and he wasn't really even a, a John Lawton. The songs, you look at the songs, you know, Boulder Box Hensley, um, Boulder, Boulder again. I mean, Trevor Boulder is not a songwriter in my book. They wrote a lot of material that was inappropriate that John, Law John Soman could not sing. The likes of No Return and Carry On, and even Out on the Streets, which is a little bit more progressive. They didn't fit John Sloman. So they were writing for John Lawton, ironically, at the time he'd left, with a man who really wasn't comfortable with where they were going. Like all of the Heap albums, it did have its moments. Carry On with the, uh, the sequenced synthesizer was very, very interesting. But all in all, I think both the fans and certainly I felt that it was time for them to take a sabbatical and take a step back and reevaluate what they were about. John Sloman came in uh, after Norton and uh, he, he was a completely different singer. He, he looked much more like, well, Robert Plant. Um, Norton looked like, well, Norton. And um, I think that the Heap management, and then I'm talking about Ken Hensley and Jerry Brown, wanted to have a frontman like David Byron again, a good looking young singer. And that's why they choose to uh, get John Sloman in the band. I think you'd have to say that John Sloman was not a good addition to Uriah Heap. He had aspirations in the Stevie Wonder mold, which just didn't fit with the band at all. Obviously the band needed freshening up, but he was certainly not the man to freshen it up. John Sloman was the worst move vocally Heap ever made. He's easily the worst of the bunch. And it's not, again, I have to say, not because he's a bad singer. He is a good singer, but he was never really brought properly into the Uriah Heap fold. They never wrote for what he was comfortable with. They wrote too many rockers that John Sloman couldn't sing. He was better at the slower stuff. Sloman a good addition to your eye heat. I think you should ask Ken Hensley that. No, I think it was completely a mistake, but I was in a minority of one in that decision. The decision was made democratically between John Sloman and Pete Golby. I wanted Pete Golby, the other guys wanted John Sloman. They got John Sloman, I left and they hired Pete Golby. Go figure. Ken Hensley was on the other hand not very happy with Sloman because he sang the songs so different from their original state. You take a song like Feelings, for example. A song like Feelings is so simple. And John Sloman just tried to turn it into a Gino Vanelli song. I mean, you know, feelings, empty feelings, praying, hoping, needing, just when I wanted to hold you, you're leaving, you're leaving. It's very straightforward, but John just took it there and there and everywhere. And the problem was, most of the time, I couldn't understand what he was singing. And my songs have never been about that. My songs have always been about words that are straightforward, easy to understand, and maybe you can relate to them. You can't relate to it when somebody's going, it's impossible. I mean, <laughs> I constantly said to him, but you know, you're not singing the tune. He'd say, I am. I said, no, no, you're singing a variation on the tune. What you don't realize is the public have heard the, the tune at the beginning of the song. Halfway through the song, you're doing an improvisa improvisation on the, on the tune. So they don't know what you're singing. You know what you're singing, but they don't. I don't know. It did, John has his style, but it just didn't fit Uriah Heap as far as I was concerned. And it ultimately became the main reason why I finally just decided to leave.
Feelings was one of the was one of the songs that we had we had done uh, or we recorded for the last album before uh, Rai Heap and myself split. I always felt it was a good song. It has been changed in the meantime, I think, and done on a slightly different way. But the original version of it has always been uh, one of my favourite songs, anyway. It just has a certain feel to it, it has a flow to it, and it's, it has it, it just has all the thing, the ingredients of a good a good pop song, I think. I had feelings was a, a, a very good song. Again, it was a pop song. I think it fits into the same general category as a song like Love or Nothing. I think we performed it very well. Um, what it lacked was the essential heap ingredient. Uh, we allowed it to be taken away from being a straightforward, straight ahead, melodic pop rock song and, and it turned into a straightforward, straight ahead, melodic pop rock song with vocals that were virtually unintelligible and interrupted the energy of the song. That's what really happened. Feelings is an example of the poppy direction that the band occasionally were veering in at this time and uh, where there's a rare piece of film where they appeared on a Granada television variety show which is, uh, which is quite a classic. With the GE minor chord structure and feel to it, it certainly gives it a poppy feel. A wonderful harmony guitar introduction on this particular song. Um, it's evident that they were being pressurised after Free Me to deliver more and more stuff in this pop style. Um, it's not one of my favourites, but from this era, I think it's one of the better ones. Sloman never gets to grips with it. He always feels uncomfortable. He always feels like he's living in the shadow of what he's trying to emulate more than anything else. John Lawton sang it much closer to the original melody. And so I think the song has a lot more energy because of that. When you break up a melody and interrupt it in the way that John Sloman used to do, then what you do is you pull away a lot of the energy from the song or you distract people's hearing. So Sloman's caught in this no man's land between trying to emulate Lawton and failing and trying to set a new style and standard for Heap and failing. So if you really want to hear what feelings is all about, it's not the version that Sloman did. Really, the whole of Conquest is a highlight. The compositions are of a uniformly high standard and it has its own unique sound. It's a really, really good record. Musically, there are moments which really work on Conquest. Unfortunately, then the vocals let it down. No Return, Carry On, which really pump out the driving atmosphere. You've also got Out on the Streets, which is something of a prog rocker. And It Ain't Easy, which is slightly more laid back and is probably the one track on the album which really fits Sloman very well. Had they had a different vocalist, had they held on to Lawson, you get the feeling that maybe things would have been different. However, it turns out to be a patchy album. And with the exception of It Ain't Easy, really an album that doesn't have one song that everything comes together rather well. Well, you've got to be deaf not to really understand that the true musical highlight of the album was Trevor Boulder's bass playing. All the way through, the bass performances are exemplary. Won't Have to Wait Too Long, for example, is absolutely fantastic. No Return is great. Mixed guitar solo and Out on the Street is fantastic. And actually Trevor, who wrote uh, and sang the lead vocal on It Ain't Easy, again, showed how much he was forging a presence within Uriah Heep, which he, he does to this day.
musical highlights. Do you want me to be honest? The gaps between the tracks. I don't think there is one. It's a well recorded album, it's a fantastically recorded album. And the playing on it is absolutely superb. You know, I've, I've gone in and mixed and remixed stuff in, in the last 10 years on this album. No one can say it wasn't played well. No one can say it wasn't constructed well. But the singing was absolutely wrong for Uriah Heep. It's not a successful album, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Uh, again, I produced it. Oh no, I'm the executive producer on it, so who did reproduce it? For me, the highlight, the absolute highlight of the Conquest album was getting it finished and being done with it. Because it, it was not an enjoyable project to work on for me at all. And I had pretty much made up my mind that it was the last album I was going to do and subsequently following the Conquest tour, that was when I decided to pack it in. The band with John Sloman didn't really quite know what they wanted to be. They'd lost their focus completely. Hensley seemed to be locked into his own world. He was playing well, but seemed to be far removed from the rest of the band. I was felt so totally separated from everything in the band and everyone in the band. It was hard for me to work up any enthusiasm um, normally. The only way I worked up enthusiasm was by doing immense amounts of drugs or something. and That's no way to carry on at all. Mick Box seemed to be uncomfortable because he knew it wasn't working properly. He had a very strong rhythm section and Chris Slade had been brought in on drums, who was an excellent drummer, formerly with Man For Man and was to go on to be a member of ACDC briefly. And of course, he still had Trevor Boulder there. And John Sloman didn't really ever convince up front. For me, John Sloman um, brought some excellent compositions and some great work in the studio. But on stage, he really, really struggled with the, particularly the Byron era material. He just couldn't deliver the old material on stage. And some of the live recordings from that era are frankly embarrassing. There is a complete live recording which I've, which I've mixed very recently and that live recording has a lot of the classic heat numbers sung by John Sloman and it has a lot of the songs that ended up on Conquest obviously sung by John Sloman and the best way to summarise this is the songs that John Sloman recorded for Conquest live are interpreted extremely well. The classic songs, to me they don't work. It's difficult for any singer to walk into the shoes of someone so established as, say, a David Byron. So it's maybe unfair to judge him on his performance of those songs. I think one should judge him on the performance of the songs that he did with the band, uh, such as Carry On, and his performance on these was great. Nobody equaled David Byron's antics on stage. I mean, he was a terrific showman. And again, you know, the trouble is the band are constantly look, looking back at what they used to do rather than going forward. So they didn't get a, a replacement who was a better showman than, than uh, David. They got someone who wasn't nearly as good and wasn't even trying to, be, to do what he used to do. So I have seen John Sloman in Holland and uh, I don't think it was a very good performance really. It wasn't dry hip anymore. Had he run out of ideas by this stage? Well, as an outsider looking in, I would have to say yes. I think it was time for a long break to sit back and take stock of the situation. Actually, I don't think so, because if you listen to the material that was recorded from Fallen Angel through Five Miles, and there are some stunning tracks there, they could have plundered the vaults and come out with, with another album's worth of songs. By this time, the band really wasn't interested in ideas. I think, you know, we had gone through that whole situation with Lee being fired and Chris Slade coming in and so on and so forth. It was just so completely dysfunctional at that point. 
and I certainly wasn't interested in giving my full energy and enthusiasm to it. If you go to a Uriah Heat gig today and it's only got two people in it that were in the original band, the songs that they are still trading on were all written by Ken Hensley. And Ken, whatever you say, wrote it down on a piece of paper, a few words, a few chords, a few sketches of the melody, but those were the songs that were successful. And once you threw that out the window, you threw everything out the window with it, really. So I, I think that we just ran out of everything. I don't, it wasn't just ideas, I think we just ran out of energy, enthusiasm. We certainly ran out of cohesion. It was doomed at that point, as far as I was concerned. Day after day, I feel this way, that I need to be moving on. You know I depend on you. I think with the departure of Ken Hensley, it appeared that Uriah Heap had run out of steam, but it's a real tribute to Mick Box that he was going to lock himself away, gather his energy, and just round the corner would see a bominog and a whole new chapter. Hensley's ideas were way out of date. Mick Box clearly had what it took to take the band forward. He was being hampered and held back. Once Hensley left the band, it was as if the shades came off, the shackles came off, and heat moved forward. We've always said, you know, we're very proud of our history, but we need to keep moving forward in, in, in many different ways, you know, to, to keep us vibrant. And I think that's the important thing. Yeah.